try to live by the gun, or you die by the sword. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Microviews. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And in continuation of our religious-centered block of episodes, yes. we decided to take a kind of brief look at a movie that we both have an ire for, I will say that. We do. It's it's a much more modern representation than Ten Commandments was. Yeah. We decided to take a look at the uh, Christ exploitation flick God's Not Dead, a movie about a narrow-minded dickhead philosopher professor whose ego is threatened by an equally narrow-minded college freshman. Yes, and... And a bunch of side stories that only serve that really to distract from, like, 30 minutes of actual movie. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so I won't lie. I was I was heavy-handed in pairing this with Ten Commandments. <laughs> because Ten Commandments is such a... Despite it being very long, and it does have some of its issues, age being one of them, it is a very good story, despite being, like, minus excluding the Christian-based stuff. And that's how we wanted to take on God's Not Dead. Because we knew eventually we'd have to get into, at the minimum, the parent company who owns God's Not Dead. Yeah. At some point, we were going to have to talk about them. Because honestly, they have not stopped growing since this movie came out (laughs) in 2013. Yeah. And for those who missed our last episode or are new to us, uh, Cryosploitation Film is a movie designed to empower or reaffirm someone's faith while making... Uh, someone who's not a believer very uncomfortable or make them feel bad for not believing. Yes. Whereas, like, it, the, the reason it, like, has a separate differentiation to other religious films, whether that be Christian or not, is that very strong focus on the negative vibe, the negative feeling, the negative mindset, viewpoint, however you want to say it. It's always some staunch atheist. Yes, and that is a theme that, uh, while this movie did not cold hard start, this movie promoted it so strongly. This movie was popular the moment it came out in 2014. I had friends and family, well, not a lot of my family, because by this point we were, we were not super strict, like we were all old, like everyone in our family was old enough to watch what, you know, secular movies, Mm -hmm. listen listen to different stuff. But I I still had lots of friends who, like, their parents were very strict on what they could watch, and it had to come with the Jesus stamp on it. This was distributed and is still owned by Pure Flix Entertainment. I think they changed their name recently, though. They did, but everyone knows them by the name Pure Flix, and so I'm going to refer to them in this episode by that, because honestly, every movie that you know them by was made during the time period where they were going by that name. Mm -hmm. Granted... They have since also merged with some other big names in the overarching branch. I think they now owned um, Faith Families Films. The overarching Olive Branch? Yeah, kind of. And, like, I definitely had friends who, at the time when this movie came out, um, there had been a push right beforehand for this company, Pure Fox Entertainment, To have their own, like, Netflix version of itself. They wanted to have their own YouTube version of themselves. They really wanted to move away from just having Christian uh, TV and entertainment and media be something for everyone. Just kind of out there and ready, like what we saw previously with the Ten Commandments time period. They wanted it to be somewhere that you could just go and have everything catered to you was what was advertised. I know for a fact, from my own experience, that it was used very much as, like, a way to just put on kind of like children's like YouTube Mm -hmm. where you put it on and just can claim like no problems here. Yeah. And because of that, there was so many movies with terrible writing, terrible directing, terrible acting, but because they had this stamp, I had friends who like, we went to go see this in theaters. Their parents like had us go several times. It was passion of the Christ all over again. But whereas that one was like, Oh, well, it's so historic. It's so, like, inspirational. It's so detailed. Yeah. None of these were. No. And that's where my beef is. Because I was forced to watch this movie multiple times. I had to pay money. I had to pay my oh, own geez. my own high schooler money <laughs> to watch this film. And it's 
it is a bad movie, and that is where my beef is with this. Yeah, and I, I only watched it because I heard everyone talking about it so much when I was in college. Yeah. And yeah. my youngest brother really likes this movie, so I, I watched it. I think when we were in college, the second one had just come out, and that was like a big deal. Uh, I don't know. I was I was in grad school and I watched this, so that That's, yeah. I, I don't think the second one had come out when I had seen it. At I, least I so. understand. I understand. Um, but yeah, so God's Not Dead story written by Hunter Dennis with story written by Chuck Coz- Col- Consulman I think. and <laughs> Carrie Solman, uh, directed by Harold Kronk, and it stars Kevin Sorbo, who I will refer to specifically as Hercules for most of this. I, that's uh, fair. For those of who you who remember the old '90s Hercules show, that's yeah, that that's, man. That's him and Shane Harper. Um, and also, before we really get into it, I just want to say, fuck this DVD because it it's has a terrible menu. Oh, we, we <laughs> people bitch about YouTube thirty second ads. This DVD, yeah. something I physically own now. Yeah, you can't skip two minutes of advertisements and trailers for Pure Flix. Yes, and that is not unique. Um. Again, like I said, I had a lot of friends who, like, this was the only media in their house um, when we were friends. Not my house. Thank God. I would have gone crazy because this is a th- regular thing with these DVD menus was be- when you push play, ads started. Before you could get to the menu, unskippable. Like, you can't s- fast forward. Unskippable nope. ads there, too. Like, I don't need more ads. I want to watch Veggie Tales. <laughs> uh, it, it just it infuriates me so much in something that I own. Like I I I I I'm okay with like okay I gotta skip ahead like twenty frames. Um, that's fine. That takes me five seconds to do. But it's it's a substantial amount of time. And as someone who I do normally like having VHSs or DVDs that come with the previews and the ads, mm-hmm. but I like it when they are skippable because like this movie was one that was on repeat. Like, it was on every Saturday or Wednesday night for youth group. Like, it was one of the movie options, like, quote-unquote, that we could watch. Um, Like, this is unnecessary. The ads need to be skippable. Yeah, no, I completely agree. (laughs) Also note that this entire story was based off of Rice Brock's book, God's Not Dead, Evidence for God in the Age of Uncertainty, which, right before this movie was written, was an incredibly popular book. Like, a lot of people read that before the movie even was, like, thought of. Never heard of it. I know you haven't. <laughs> I had a lot of friends who, like, it was passed around as the, like, you need to read this. This is the book that will give you all of the answers to any argument anyone can ever give you. <laughs> the book is, I think, better written than the movie. It does have, it lays things out a little bit better. Okay. It's a lot less arguing to your shower sort of <laughs> styling. Like, it, it, it's still not a great narrative. I'm. It was not my favorite book. I'm not a fan of negative voices in in books, I, I'm there for fantasy, I want dragons. But just know that, like, a lot of the story, a lot of the plot points come from that book. Okay. Well, that makes sense because, I mean, holy shit, this movie is slow to begin with. I mean, <laughs> so it takes ten minutes to set everything up, and most of the stories, like, eat, like all the side stories, all we get introduced to before the main story. Because, That's true. And I'm also yes. glad we did the Magic Christian before this because both movies suffer from the same issue of trying yes. to cover too much and with too little of a subplot, like, there oh, are 100%. seven or eight different subplots that they try to interweave yes. in God's Not Dead. Like, first off, the leftist reporter with cancer, which they are very hard on the leftist. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> saying it heavy. Uh, they do, like, they have, like, and it is it is a director's choice is why we're making fun of it. Like, it is said in a way that, like, these actors were told to say it this way, mm-hmm. and you can tell. Because they're so uncomfortable when they're doing it. Yeah, I think Fox News kind of enunciation. Yeah, it, it feels very forced. Yeah. There's a Muslim girl hiding her faith, a pastor and his friend trying to get to Disneyland. Yeah, I forgot uh, about them, I'm the, not gonna lie. The Chinese exchange student, who is only, like, three seeds baby. I also forgot about that person. And constantly calling his dad about, oh, have you heard? about this religion christianity um yeah there's a concert that's mentioned at the beginning that only comes up at the end to try and bring everything together which there that's the thing i've come across with a lot of these style of christian movies it was a popular thing at the time or there's always some great event that they're trying to do at the end like let there be light where it's like oh what if we all hold our cell phones up to the sky and make like a portrait for jesus so part of that was there was at this uh, just like honestly, just a little bit before this time, like mm, two thousand six ish is kind of like where it really started heading off. Was having 
having uh specifically musicians, but honestly, there was a couple of different like genres of media and entertainment that had become popular in the mainstream by what everyone assumed was undercover espionage sort of thing. <laughs> We're like, oh, they made it onto the big screen and nobody notices that they're Christian. How cool is that? Hollywood plants or Christian plants, as this one would be. Yeah. And when it started in like the 2005-ish area, a lot of those bands, because it was mostly bands, got famous because they had good music and they just got picked up by labels and it was on the radio. And like, it wasn't necessarily a secret, but honestly, like nobody... Nobody really cared, minus the people who were, like, using that to, like, then promote other media. Mm -hmm. And so it got this, like, wave of, like, oh, well, we're going to have such and such band in our movie, and it will bring people who aren't necessarily, like, coming for the movie. They'll They'll know about X, Y, or Z person, and they'll come. And this movie suffers from it twice. There's a cameo. And there's the the Newsboys is like the big event. And at the time, the Newsboys were a very popular band. And they were one of those bands that a lot of people felt fit into the whole like, oh, they're cool Christians. Like anybody can like them sort yeah. of thing. Which like, regardless of whether or not that's true, it is used as such a weak plot point that when we finally get to the Newsboys concert, I'm genuinely shocked. <laughs> Even though they told me at the beginning of the movie that that was, like, the end goal. Well, and even then, because it's never mentioned again until, like, the very end. Until, yeah, no. And, and then you're just like, oh, surprise. And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember this band. And what you were describing is just basically the Jonas Brothers in the South Park episode with the purity rings. And... Okay, so the Jonas Brothers were the peak of this idea of, like, Christian media becoming oh, mainstream. Were they? they were. They were the peak. Okay. Um, I, I didn't find out about the Jonas Brothers until I moved back to the States and we were traveling as unaccompanied minors and they're like, totally oh, the, like the Jonas Brothers, it's like, we have no clue who the hell you're talking about. Yeah, they were they were 100% the peak of this idea of like, well, they're famous, but it's like they're also Christian and they don't like hide their faith, but they are not famous because they're Christian artists. Okay. Sort of thing. Like, that. they were, like, the highest peak of that version like, of entertainment. Like, in the middle scene, Devil Wars, Prada, yes. Under Oath, all those bands. Exactly. Like, okay. a lot of those. And, like, the overlap between, like, that fan base versus people who were going to watch this movie was pretty high. Mm-hmm. And so, a lot of directors and writers would put in bands like, or even, like, do a copy version of bands like that to be, like, look, we're playing something like their music, or in this case, because they had the budget, hey, look, we have these famous people, don't you want to see this band in this mm. movie? It's kind of like the draw. Okay, I can see that. Back to subplots, because there's like there's five so more many. of them. There's uh, too many. <laughs> we also have Hercules dating an ex-student who's also of the faith, but he's he goes through this whole bit of like, they're kind of, there's only room for two of us in this relationship. I don't need you thinking of another man while we're banging. Basically. Yeah. And then also, who she also has a brother who is supposedly some morally corrupt businessman. I would not a, lie, I totally forgot about the brother yeah, as well. With a mom suffering from Alzheimer's who was also dating, and the brother was also dating the leftist reporters. Yes, also something that, like, because, because honestly it's not an important detail, but it is a weird thing that comes up, and it's something that happens, like, regularly in, very specifically, like, the pure flicks entertainment made movies is this emphasis on mothers and like how like you have betrayed them Mm -hmm. and because of their like upcoming death their passing their memories their ghosts like Uh, that like it is a plot it is a plot point that was so common that even when this movie came out all of us who watched it were like the mom trope again (laughs) just parents in general because i watched one recently um that was about a man who was dying in his he was kind of a crotchety old man Mm -hmm. but the Mm -hmm. nurse who was going to take care or was seeing for like his hospice care basically was gonna just take the best care of him maybe introduce him to the faith turns out she she's adopted and this is her real father that is and she wants to find out about her mother this is a trope that was so hard hitting that like even even those of my friends who were like this movie is the way the, of the future. This is going to be, like, the next media <laughs> big blockbuster thing. Even they had to admit, like, okay, yeah, this movie's a little heavy-handed on, like, the dead mom trope. Mm-hmm. It's it's like when anything, like, because in a way, anything, any movie that's following a trend could be slightly considered an exploitation film. Sure, like, like it has a spot in that slot. Yeah, like when Hunger Games came out, we had that rise of teen survival hit for we sure dystopic did. movies. So many dystopic movies for teens. Yeah, 
None of them are as good as Battle Royale, but well, that's, there's an- a, that's another. There's a lot of dystopia <laughs> movies that, like, we could have done better, but they were for not me. Yeah, no, exactly. Essentially, it was it. Exactly. And then also, let's not forget, the girlfriend who oh, yeah. is only in, like, three scenes in this entire movie. She's, like, barely in this movie. Who they, they mentioned that they've been dating since, like, they were 12 or 13, and she's got, like, it, she's even got a promise ring on, too. Yeah, it, this, this movie suffers very badly from having a very weak base plot. So, mm-hmm. like, our main, our main character, Josh Wheaton, his main problem and plot and drama, because this movie, when it came out, advertised itself as drama. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, that that makes more sense for what they were advertising to, right? Um, the drama that Josh encounters is so lacking and so minimal and is over so easily that we've added all of these peop- other people to also have drama. And the difference between the drama of this and the drama of the Ten Commandments mm-hmm. feels so mildly different. Even if you take out the historic context. Well, here's the thing is one, it's all so generic, just it is getting very everything generic. set up and all the side stories. Everyone looks so boring. But also it's because like it doesn't feel like an actual trial, whereas like Moses's feels like a trial. Yes. That our trial for this is a student is dealing with a dickhead professor. Yes. And, the- and honestly, the dickhead professor isn't even that like realistic because i've heard some horror stories i've had some horror stories of professors Mm -hmm. this professor is freaking tame Mm -hmm. compared to a professor that we had who like literally took someone's final model for their final grade the day before it was to be turned in put it on the ground and stood on it shit yeah this professor is just like sign this or you fail it's like you can just go to the dean and be like look this is unethical yeah no exactly like we are trying so hard to fix a problem that doesn't exist in this movie that it makes it feel cheap it's the dumbest way to start a class let's fuck our entire course our what's our course syllabus because i'm trying to prove a point to one single stupid student how mad would you be if you paid money for this 8 a.m class monday wednesday friday and this was how your entire class went. Just <sighs> this one kid arguing with a dick professor, and you're like, I'm gonna fail! Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, like, the movie's not even trying to hide its agenda. One, they'd all no. pass because, surprise, surprise, the dickhead professor dies at the very end, basically. He, well, and, you know, he has a change of heart and then dies. Yeah, but because mm-hmm. your professor died. I mean, well, you do get an A in that class. Yeah. We, we thought about that long and hard. Also, if your building burns down, you get an A. We also <laughs> thought about that long and hard. I think we all did at one point. We got close. I'm yeah. not gonna lie. <laughs> and, yeah, and that's the one thing about these movies. Why don't I bring up the oh, it's a leftist reporter? Is because the all these movies have a very stringent agenda that they're trying to portray. Like st- that's the drama. Yeah. Like unlike Moses, who is literally like leading a nation through starvation and plagues. Mm-hmm. These people's problem is that like oh. So and so is yelling at me. Yeah, the, you're like this doesn't feel like drama anymore. Well, and it's because the entire point of this movie is it's said in the character, one the main character's line where he says, "Yeah, I feel like God needs someone to defend it." Yeah, it it is a weak argument. The yeah, other, the other thing, which was a complaint from the day that this released, not just by me and some of my friends, but by actual critics, is because we have so many people in this movie, mm-hmm. everyone feels incredibly hollow. Like they're writing. There's not a lot of time for any character development. Nobody had, like, you could not tell me a single one of these characters' favorite colors or favorite foods. Like, they have, they have no personality. They are shells of a person. Yeah. They are very weakly written, and unfortunately, be- they're weakly directed, and their acting doesn't add anything either. Like, we're not, we're not getting anyone like Cage who's bringing their own thoughts and research mm-hmm. into these characters. These guys were given lines, and they did, they did what they were asked to do, which is good, and like, no complaints there, but, they were given a, a little a little useless prop person and like there's nothing extra happening including the main character and the main adversary like the main enemy himself is the most boring man yeah i mean because the thing with this movie too is like if you really believed you wouldn't need her you wouldn't have to defend against hercules because he's just too evil and corrupt and you're just so good and just. He's too good of a goody two shoes. And then on top of that, yeah, it's always the same trope. Of, it is. It is the exact same, and it's honestly very boring at this yeah. point. Well, and on top of that, the trope of the atheist antagonist, or sometimes the antagonist turned protagonist, is always an atheist because of some tragedy, or almost always cancer. That's true. 
That's that is true, and it is something that this movie itself. Part of the reason why, like, I blame bad writing for a lot of this movie is in this movie itself. I'm not even talking about its sequels because we're not even going to bother. Mm-hmm. But in this movie itself, it goes back on its own statement of like the logic of the cancer being the problem of all of these people's mm-hmm. for, not all, but like a a, a large majority of these like side characters have some problem with either dead parent or cancer or both. Mm-hmm. And like it's an uncomfortable amount to the point where you're like, all right, we need like one person. One person with a dead parent and that could also be the cancer. Like just one, not six. <laughs> yeah. No, and, like, exactly. And it goes back on itself repeatedly on like where the villain and the evilness in this movie is coming from Mm -hmm. because it says it very blatantly multiple times but unlike example again ten commandments because it's i think a very good example of drama um unlike that one where the evil was clear and consistent in the story and in the writing and in the acting everyone knew and even in the music like even the music made it very clear like this is a bad guy he's gonna be an asshole the whole movie and that's how it is. Like, this is who you're rooting against. This it's, movie doesn't bother. Yeah, no, it's it just it's just a bunch of crap that they threw together to try and work. And yeah, yeah, it, it's the other part that's very frustrating is there is no details involved in this film. And that's another part that's very frustrating is because this movie is a relatively like it's a full length movie. It's 113 ish minutes minus or. I think without the credits and beforehand. Putting in the DVD, it's almost a full two hours. Yeah, I was gonna say the DVD does extend the <laughs> runtime significantly. Um, but like it this is a full length movie. And there is almost no detail in music, in costuming, in set design, in character development. Like there's no clues for who to root for, what emotions anyone is feeling. There's nothing. Budget. Yeah, okay. Budget could have been an argument. However, this budget for this movie was one of the highest for this kind of film Mm -hmm. that had been set almost ever. But for a Hollywood standard, it's still a low budget movie. For a Hollywood standard, low budget, which is why I could have given a lot of the acting a pass. Mm -hmm. We hired good actors. Like, these are all people with experience, but we are not hiring, like, Again, we're not hiring a cage, right? Like we're no. hiring, we're hiring people within the same industry. They're willing to work for less money. Um, they're honestly, they're a little less. You know, they're not. No one's getting an Oscar here, but that's okay. No. I watch lots of movies where they're, the no Oscar is going to happen. It, they're here for the message, is why they're acting. In which it. is fine. I watch yeah. lots of those movies, but like, I mean, there's people who take budget cuts to be in Wes Anderson or Martin Scorsese movies. So. And there's lots of movies that come out that, like, they are either political or environmental mm-hmm. or, like, some form of message is being made and someone somewhere made a cut so that the budget could be low. That's not, that is not my issue here. <laughs> my issue is that the writing, which was already based on a book that was incredibly popular, was so lazy and so weak that we have nothing to do during this movie. That debate of do we stay faithful to the book or do we cut a bunch of it and people get pissy because we didn't talk about their favorite ghost in the castle this one time that doesn't really do much. See, here's the thing about this book. <laughs> this The book was a book that was not really meant to be a story. Mm. It was a lot of like trying to win an argument sort of thing using stories, okay. which is kind of how we ended up with like so many background people. And a way to try to it be its own allegory. Yeah. And which like... During this time period, that sort of writing for Christian media was very popular. And that's, again, that's not my issue. Because in a book form, that's fine. Because I have chapters. I can put the book down. The book wanted you to, like, look at other sources. It was challenging your, like, it was supposed to be challenging worldviews. It was supposed to be challenging different (laughs) political agendas or people. And so you had to stop reading at some point to go look at those other things. Yeah. Supposedly. This movie is a movie and I don't have time to wiki things. It makes me think of uh, Ancient Aliens a little bit, where yes! instead of, like, aliens, it's Jesus. Honestly, it has a similar vibe to Ancient Aliens. And again, Ancient Aliens was fun for a minute. <laughs> We're no longer having fun. And it's still going. It's still going. I don't understand how. I thought we covered all the aliens, but <laughs> apparently not. But, yeah. But yeah, and I was not the only person. And granted, I have more complaints now as someone who has done more like I had, I now have a better understanding of how films are made and how they are written and directed. Mm-hmm. 
what level of work goes into it, what a two million budget can get you. Mm -hmm. Because let's be real, two million is not a high Hollywood budget. It is still a damn high budget compared to some movies. Yeah, I mean, there's... Even in the own time period. Yeah, I mean, it's for us, it seems like it's a lot of money from, like, an individual tiny person standpoint. Sure, but even, like, horror movies have a quarter of this budget, and they manage to have more compelling story. They have better props and scripts and sets. There's almost no sets that are distinguishable in this. You get, well, one, you gotta cover it all, and two... You got to make it for everyone. Like that could be your college that you're going to next year, young Jimmy. I would have paid more money per ticket if this had put more effort into the college setting. But there is a rough lecture hall, a couple of hallways, and then honestly, it's just other people's dining rooms. Yeah. That's the majority of the sets here. It's boring. It feels like a TV show. Or a parking lot. Or a parking lot. Criminal Minds has better sets than this movie. I've... I've... I haven't seen Criminal Minds. It's pretty much this, but with dead people. Hmm. And it's 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 a crime show. It's a crime show that's been on for a very long time. And they, they don't have sets because everyone's fucking dead in the woods. Or they're dead in a basement. And so there's, like, no set. But that's okay. okay because, like, we have this cool, you, you know, building and our mm-hmm. office. And, like, granted, we don't see a lot of it, but, like, we know where it is. This is such a boring set universities are cool we could have had cool like we could have picked one we could have made up one we could have had buildings like open air venues you you could have made some of it feel symbolic instead of like we get to see like one church and then the outside of the other one like this this movie doesn't tie into the college experience in any way this movie doesn't even tie into classes or philosophy very well it just uses everything as like a very weak plot point that isn't even shown it's just briefly mentioned yeah. And that's where my main beef with this movie comes well, from. And even then, let's talk about the main debate, because, like, this this debate, like I said, is only, like, maybe 30 minutes of a two-hour movie. It is. And it's it, it, and when the debate ends, we still have 30 minutes of the movie left to go. And on top of that, the, with the, the when you break it down, when you truly watch this film with a critical eye and you try and break apart all the storylines... There is actually only one conflict in this movie other that is like something that people can control. Everyone else's conflicts are things that are out of their control, whether that be overseas foreign dad, cancer, or death, right? Mm-hmm. This one is a professor telling them to sign a waiver that says God is dead. Yeah. That is the entire problem in this film. And again, this is the least creative way to show a college student's problems. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the thing, too, is, like, it's such a dumb plot, too, where, like... Yes. Oh, it's it's very much the David and Goliath, where it's, like, mm-hmm. Hercules is a dickhead professor who's supposed to expect a student to fail and not defend themselves against what, what he's supposed to be an expert in his field, which... Which is not yeah. proven in any way. No, it's all... Fil- it's full... Fil- it's a philosophy class. Let, let's remind everyone that this is a philosophy. This movie is about a philosophy class by people who have never been in a philosophy class. Yeah, there is class- no debate happening. Like none of the students are bringing any like knowledge or textbooks. There's mm-hmm. not even learning about philosophy. No happening. No, we we don't even get pat. Well, we kind of get supposedly there was he gives like a little bit of his class, and then they spend the end of class debating, and even then it's just like. This is clearly written by someone who's never been in a philosophy class. Yeah. Well, and also, like, the debate's over in, like, two classes. It is. Because the rest, like, there's, this is such a weak, like, it, this movie clearly wants to show a college student's trials with going somewhere that has so many non-believers and atheists and people attacking his faith and religion. Which, if that's what you want to show, great. But they're not showing that because everyone else in that classroom is with the main character. They yeah. are for it, they are with it, and they are just too shy to, or like, not as quote-unquote firmly believing, because that's what the movie wants you to sit, take out of this. Mm-hmm. They are not as firm in their faith as this guy. And there is a reason for this. This is a trope that came about from a long-standing problem. Okay. So this idea, this idea of you need to stand up and be persecuted for your faith is a romantic thing that comes back from the Columbine shootings. Oh, and even before then, like... It was a thing beforehand. It's it's the ideal of martyrdom. It is. But when the shootings happened, as a nation, we all experienced a tragedy. And there was a group of people, the Christians, and specifically the evangelical Christians, who saw this, had this trauma happen, and did not know how to deal with it. 
Mm. And I, I truly do think that this is why I wanted to show the Ten Commandments versus this one. Because the way that these movies go about showcasing their religion and showing off their religion goes from being, this is the Bible, this is what we believe, let me show you, let me show you all the history and research and effort I have put into this story and understanding it, to a very scared and hate-filled message that is mm. honestly spends a lot less time trying to research its own problems. It does a lot less effort to show uh, character development. It does a lot less effort to show interest in, like, the greater world. Like, I truly think that that moment is where we see a huge split in the Christian media. Mm. Okay. Whether whether or not that that is, like, the point, for me, that's what I feel like a lot of it comes down to, because this, this idea of, like, incredibly negative voice in writing is something that this movie did the best, got the most money for, because this movie made a fuck ton of money. Yeah. Compared to what it started with. Compared to other movies of the year, honestly, not really. Think paranormal <laughs> activity level of, of small budget, high they, grossing. Exactly. So, like, this movie made a lot of money and then made no progress with that money. Whereas with, like, Ten Commandments, we saw DeMille being very open and aggressive about wanting to rehire people that he mm -hmm. thought were important and faithful. Uh, he wanted to show that in himself. Whereas this film, I mean, we have, what, what five other ones? Or one in the work? Yeah, I think there's a total of four right now and a fifth one. And the fifth one, if I remember right... Because what kind of started this, too, was uh, my buddy Sugi Logic, which mm -hmm. check out his stream. When I was visiting him in October, we each bought each other a movie or gave each other a movie to buy. Yes. I made him buy God's Not Dead, and he made me buy the Scorpion King collection. The Scorpion King collection is mwah, so good. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's I, also I, garbage, though. Yes, but enjoyable <laughs> garbage compared it, to this. It is. But, like, there... There is not that same level of commitment that we saw with DeMille and his production mm -hmm. company. Because what I understand that he like did not have the backing of this big company, Pure Flix, behind him, but he was a big name. He had his own like group of people. Like he might as well have been his own production company, minus the title and licensing. They were just backing him that strongly because he was showing off these characteristics that this movie and this company say they want to show off, mm -hmm. but, like, we're not seeing that follow-through. No one's being rehired on good faith. No one's being pulled <laughs> off of a blacklist because they have faith in that person and who they could be and the potential of forgiveness. There is a mixed... There, There is a, such a huge, wide difference between m the movies of the past and the movies of today. Yeah, well, and the whole thing with this movie, too, is it's just the... And it mainly is, like, the end of the debate, too, where it's the yes. very dumb... Oh, God, and because this is when he reveals that he hates God because of cancer and whatnot, and then and everyone mommy, claps yeah. and is converted to Christianity and is, we're going to a concert later together, guys. Yeah, and the other thing that should be noted is I firmly believe that the majority of this $2 million budget was for getting rights to have the Newsboys play in it, because they do play, and they do show up in this movie, and also to have a Duck Dynasty member appear. Yeah. Which at the time, that was a big deal because Duck Dynasty was a huge TV show, especially with the Christian group. Yeah, I know. This, however, came out right... I think this was right after one of the Duck Dynasty family members had the whole controversy. And so there was a very large divide happening on whether or not we still liked Duck Dynasty if you were also in the same group who like was being forced to watch this movie. Okay. Yeah, I... I don't keep up with any of that crap. So. There's, it's not really even like useful clap. It was again. This is it is drama that only was necessary in this particular <laughs> setting. Like it was very similar of like, wow, this shouldn't be an issue. This yeah. shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be drama. We could all just move on with our lives if we had just some basic like togetherness. But it's, instead, it is a huge plot point. It's like Tiger King at the start of the pandemic, where yes. everyone was so into it. But you and I, who are in the true crime world, were like, we've been hearing about we're, this story for like two years, guys. This is not new. Oh, yeah. Especially <laughs> especially with Missouri being the way it is with, like, you can just own random ass shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, like, we've been here. We've done Tiger King. No, it was exactly the same. Where it's like, some common sense and Tiger King would not have been as cool as it was. No. Is exactly the same sort of drama where, like, yes, it is entertaining to an extent, but it is not this deep, like, talk-worthy thing that it wanted to be mm -hmm. because it did not give me any details. It did not give me any effort into these characters or this story or this plot. Yeah. It was just shallow. 
And here's what I will say. There is one one character we have heavily overlooked. Okay, that's true. Because all the other characters go nowhere. Yeah, uh, except, no, true. they all go to the concert except for Hercules who dies. The girlfriend. She is the most oh, believable yeah. character in this movie because that's true. the last time we see her is she's saying like, hey, maybe you're looking into this a bit too much. Your parents are kind of right. Like, cause once we that's get, true. once we get to the debate, the slides, the animation, this all the research this dude has done, he is a hundred percent failing all of his other classes. Oh no. Yeah. No, this man is now going to be paying for more college because he couldn't get his act together. Yeah. Well, at I least he got like- an A in his philosophy class. <laughs> yeah. By default, I worry about this man having to take creative writing. Uh, yeah, well, I worry about whoever wrote this movie with creative writing. Yeah, and that that's that that's what boils down to it. Is like this: I'm capable of watching shitty TV. Mm-hmm. I'm perfectly capable of watching of shitty movies. Some of my favorite, oh, let's be real, the majority of my favorite movies are crap. But the reason they are crap is because they are either visually stimulating. Or they are just a goofy fun time. Think Scorpion King. Yeah. It is silly. It is goofy. I mostly am here to watch a man punch other people. I'm here to watch a sexy woman pop out of water. Yeah. However, despite the silliness, despite the goofiness, there was an effort made. Yeah. Right? Like, we, we've talked plenty about, like, B-movies or even just kind of, like, badly written movies that, like, yeah, I enjoyed it a little bit, but, like, it was bad. I'm not mm-hmm. watching it again. The ones I'm rewatching, an effort from somebody was made. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, it's Nick Cage who put the effort in. Yeah. But that's why we like it. No one in any part of this movie, no, the music, not in the editing, not in the lighting, no one put effort into this movie enough to, like, keep me coming back. No, no, exactly. And also, one of my other favorite parts of this movie yes. is when Hercules dies. Mm-hmm. So, by the way, second movie I've seen of him in the this year where uh, he's in a car accident that changes his life. and fate. Yeah, that's another trope that showed up a lot during yeah. this time period. Alcoholism, too. Well, um, that's just, that one's been around for a while. I'll give that one a pass. It's when he gets hit by the car and he's dying, and it's one of the two pastors who are trying to go to Disneyland, which... Oh, their I story, forgot about them. <laughs> their story's kind of cute, where, like, everything is for preventing them from going to Disneyland. All so that they they can be there to comfort Hercules in his dying hour. And also be able to miraculously tell that his ribs are crushed just by looking at him in his pristine, non-bloodied clothing. And not even, like, dirty clothing from, like, rolling on the ground. A just... prime example of just honestly lazy writing. <laughs> just lazy There's no, yeah, there's, there's not general. even, like, the standard anime blood dripping out of his mouth no, or anything. No, no. Like, and, like, I get that the this movie was trying to hit that target audience of, like, anyone can watch it, so we're not going to do blood, we're not going to do cussing, the, no nudity, obviously. None of that, which is fine. But again, even Moses kills a man. Yeah. And that movie was rated E for everybody. He kills one of the kings of horror, Vincent Price. And, and again, but that was done with a creativity, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he even talked about how he would pan away so that you did not see the act. We come back to see the aftermath. And honestly, the yeah. aftermath was always very tame. It, it's like, and we keep bringing it up in Pan's Labyrinth, where yes. the, where the, do, where the uh, general or whatever colonel tortures the guy. And we don't see it. We just see his hand sliced open. Yeah, or even just the cutaway to the screaming. Like, mm-hmm. there is ways... To show that with a little bit of effort in directing and in editing and in camera work that just was not even put into this movie. Mm-hmm. There's honestly no creative camera work. Like, there's there's nothing. There's nothing to talk about. Yeah. And that's what's disappointing because this movie did make a lot of money. A lot of people watched it because, again, this was the first, like, really big hit to hit what was, at the time, like, a brand new group that was hoping to have, like, this, like... <laughs> They were, they were honestly hoping to have, like, a Disney for them, right? Yeah, the where, next like, generation is going to have the movie that defines their faith. Yeah, and, like, honestly, that's fair. Because, like, I grew up watching The Ten Commandments. It's part of the reason we talked about it. Mm-hmm. I would not have realized what a good and effortful movie that was if I had not been forced to listen to the very long and wordy commentary. Yeah. Because I've just always watched it, right? This movie lacks that ability because it shot itself in the foot from the get-go. Mm-hmm. And that's upsetting because I do, I, I would love to have a new version of the Ten Commandments. That would be cool. Well, and part of it is, and we kind of briefly touched on it, mm-hmm. is that a lot of these style of Christian movies, they, they're they very much in the same line 
as Christmas movies, where they're yes, they they're are hallmark, but for Christmas, cheesy, predictable, and the way the target audience wants it to end. Yes, and honestly, again, there is a place for those movies, but putting the amount of like pedestal that this movie ended up on, like having the amount of sequels that it did because it made as much money as it did, I think a lot of us agreed we all tapped out after two, right? Because like after the second one, we we were out of stuff to talk about. We were honestly out of stuff to talk about during this one, like halfway through. But like, sure, I could I could hope for a better reimagining. The the thing that like I don't think anyone wants to admit, but it's true. This is the new Left Behind series, and none of you want to admit it <laughs> because uh, the Left Behind movie was terrible. But we love it still. But, well, we did because again, someone brought some acting to it. <laughs> yeah, there was some emotional faces happening that were just. Real out there. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is very much so it's these movies kind of get stuck on this allegorical story from the Bible where it's always David versus Goliath or like Ten Commandments, Moses versus the Pharaoh, but in a classroom and seemingly small person with the power of with a very powerful projectile weapon against the symbol of tyranny, which is a single dickhead professor. And on top of that. Like, the whole movie just feels like a really poorly executed ad campaign. It does. Because this debate was so, like, they are trying to make it like this debate was so heavily reported within the Christian world that because of two class sessions of struggle, you get the Duck Dynasty dude to be basically be like, go for you, we're going to tell your story around the world. And yeah. I don't, I don't know, I can't remember if that's how he sounds, but... Honestly, Leo the Cable Guy is not a bad impression for the Tech yeah. Dynasty gang, but I have we, one, we, I ha- we know. I have one redneck voice I know. accent, and that's it. <laughs> it's okay. That's fine. <laughs> I can't do a British accent to save my butt. Um, but, yeah, no, that, that was most people's complaint. And honestly, despite having a $2 million budget, the thing that always, like, sat wrong with me, and it sat wrong with a lot of critics, mm-hmm. was this movie felt cash grabby and it's yeah. they the new ones still feel cash grabby and a lot of that has to do on playing up what used to be a really good basis for a movie a really good like starting point like honestly this is not a bad like base plot for a movie right mm-hmm. like granted it needs a lot of work it needs a lot of polishing but like we could have gotten there but unfortunately like the minimal amount of everything was put in but just enough that we could get big names big faces and like it looks passable just like a hallmark movie but at least with Christmas and Hallmark movies, we know what it is. We know that it's a silly cash grab, but it's okay. It's like stocking stuffers. It's mm-hmm. fine once in a while. This was trying to make an empire off of fluff. Yeah, I mean, look at the pillow industry. They made an empire off of fluff. They do, but at least I have to use that every night. <laughs> yeah, no, and I mean, I I've, I I've, forgot so much about this movie because, I, I, again, we had seen it probably close to when it came out. Yeah. But just going back through it and the struggle it was to get to it. Because, like, yeah. I've watched so much garbage. Oh, yeah, too. Same. But, like, this just... It was a struggle. It's preachy garbage is what it is, what's annoying about it, too. And, that, that's and, like, it, and it has such a hateful tone for the whole movie. Like, mm-hmm. there's no break. There's no comedy. There's no... no there's not even, like... It, it's not even clever. Like, it, that was my same complaint with the remake of uh, Black Christmas. Yes. Where it was such a preachy feminist message that it wasn't clever in its approach at all that... Agreed. Just annoyed the crap out of me. And granted, I, I know I picked this film because, honestly, it is an easy target compared to Ten <laughs> <Yeah>. Commandments. <laughs> However, it did start a whole empire yeah. that, like, f- very much like Hallmark, followed in a lot of the footsteps of this. The style, the writing, the effort, the effort in music and plot and character and acting development... It, it it never grew. It stayed pretty much plateaued, and we just kept making more of the same, which is kind of sad because we had seen people in the past in the film industry put so much time and effort into building up relationships and commitments mm-hmm. and putting in effort to train up the next actor who that was going to work for them. And this industry has failed to do that, which is disappointing. Um, but the other reason that, like, yes, I understand, like, compared to Ten Commandments, this is a different ballpark. It's a different style of movie for a different audience during a different time. However, the impact, the amount of people who do rewatch this every year, I would say is fairly com- comparable. Mm-hmm. Granted, it's not on, you know, the standard TV. So, like, you're not going to accidentally be watching it on Easter like everybody else. But the amount of people who do regularly re-put on this or similar is, I think, high enough to show the comparison. 
And I do want to talk about like where we are going in the future of movies, because we've talked about how we are hopeful in a lot of different mm-hmm. film industries, horror being one of them, comedy being one of them, um, the special effects industry, like very high on my list. I'm very excited to see where animation is going. This does not give me hope that there's going to be something cool happening. I was very hopeful when Prince of Egypt came out. I was like, oh, this is going to be the next, like, we're going to start Ten Commandments level and like continue it on. We're going to mm. keep pushing it. But that was DreamWorks. That's not this. No. And there's not the same amount of drive. There's not the same amount of passion for talent to be shown off in these films. And well, that's what's disappointing to me. And I think it's just because, like, the movie, like, it, even if you didn't have good acting, if the rest of the story and the actual, like, writing of mm-hmm. the movie was good, then you'd have something to work with. Sure. But if, you're, if your foundation is shit, then well, you don't have much. I mean, it. it there's theoretically, nothing to go up could, on. theoretically, it could go up, but... Honestly, it's just kind of spread out, though. And we've seen that. Like, yeah. we've seen the, the new stuff that's come out since this group came out. Like, I've seen what, I believe, uh, Gate Productions and Red Entertainment Group also backed this movie. I've seen the new stuff that they've come out with. And, like, there's some cute stuff. Honestly, the kids' things are, like, probably their best works. But a lot of that gets a pass because they're kids' things. And there's yeah. not as much effort. Or it's animated. And honestly, you don't have to worry about acting when you're animating. I I think you do have to worry about acting more so when you're animating. You're supposed to, but, like, if it's a badly drawn donkey, like, taking Jesus to Bethlehem, like, that's... I don't care anymore. Yeah, I watched (laughs) probably the most mind-numbing one of these movies uh, called Finding Jesus. Yes, I have also seen that one. The one with the fishes? Boy, the CGI hurts my eyeballs. Yeah, the the only, uh, the only, let's say, ethnic fish isn't even a fish in the movie that's true his name is mr sushi and he yeah. is a sentient piece of sushi that talks like this it's a oh, little insulting isn't oh it? why mm. maybe it, maybe do a better job little fish yeah it's <laughs> part, it part, part of my very <laughs> bad parodying of that movie but it's but fucking awful it is it's it's, it's shark tales bad um honestly maybe worse because at least that one had large actors giving really good voice performances mm-hmm. despite the really creepy fish boobs <laughs> um but yeah like there's just it, it is disappointing to see a lack of effort and talent and heart coming mm-hmm. into these productions because we have seen really cool stuff like i really did like the previous uh versions of moses and i have always enjoyed honestly the egyptian ones are my favorite because i always have a thing for like the old egyptian like sets and designs and costuming also, I think, like, because Egypt and Greek were the, such a huge focus for us when we were kids. Oh, for sure. I, like, definitely grew up, like, that was a dream to go see the pyramids. Like, that was very mm-hmm. high on the bucket list as a kid, right? Like, and I mean, it still is, but, like, for now, different, more academic reasons than just, yeah. like, the mystery and fantasy of it all. Mm-hmm. And, like, there is just a lack of mystery and joy put into these movies. And it's disappointing because I, it was an industry I grew up with. It's an industry our parents grew up with. And it's, it's sad to see such a decline because this is honestly one of the biggest titles to come out in know. recent years. My peak was Veggie Tales, And I don't, I only remember the silly songs and the chocolate bunny. Honestly. Okay. So I will let you know, because I continue to have children in my life who were Veggie Tales kids, mm. the new Veggie Tales after the original creators let go of their, their work. It is no longer the same, and it is the same problem. Granted, the, I know we've like worked in the VeggieTales world to get it back up to what it used to be, <laughs> but you cannot tell me that the passion and the effort was lost when it was transferred over. Bon, Don Bluth, uh, Land yeah, Before it Time. It is 100% uh, the Don Bluth problem. Yeah. It is 100% again the Don Bluth problem of like things being <laughs> lost in passion, and I am hoping that if we all agree together, like this is not what we want to see, we can get something better because we were so close to having like a renaissance come around when DreamWorks picked up Prince of Egypt. And then we have unfortunately just kind of fallen through since then. And honestly, even Passion of the Christ, while bad because it's honestly Mel, Brooke, or Mel Gibson. And I've talked about how I, I'm not a fan yeah, of him, but I I, I'm not a fan of his acting and his research. But again, even that one had more effort and planning and the music was really good. The, the cinematography was really good. And then we just kind of had a nosedive since then. Yeah. And I think as a collective, we should all band together <laughs> and demand better movies. <laughs> I, I agree. So in that regard, Chris, rent by streamer decline that we ever watched it despite having an audio recording of us watching it. I would like to say decline that I ever watched it, but I know if I do that actively, people would be like, oh, you have to see it. Yeah. And, and I, I do not want to be forced to watch this movie ever again. It is honestly that bad. 
when you watch it with a critical eye or even just for fun movie going. Mm-hmm. I have no desire to ever watch this again. I am so sorry you own it. That DVD menu is garbage. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat. It's it's a hard decline. I mean, there are so many better religious movies and we'll, we'll get to one yes. next week that I'm glad you discovered and I'm glad we want to talk about it. Um, there, there are so many better options than yeah. this. I mean, hell, even the original David Lynch Dune is better, because technically Dune is a religious movie. It is. It it's gets, not a Christian movie, but... Well, it, it gets a lot of things wrong, but like at least there is an effort and a, like, a level of like entry and discussion mm-hmm. that can be had from it, right? This movie is just so not worth my time. I mean, we have a good discussion on it, I think. We do, but... <laughs> I, I do feel a little bad that, like, I, I don't have anything positive to say about this, despite that I know, like, some of the people, especially the actors who worked on it, really did do, from seeing some of their other works, this is some of their better acting. However, like, it's it's a TV movie that's made too much money. Yeah, that that's a good way to put it, is it's, it, it does have that TV level of production where it's just trying to distract you from everything and just yeah. be as widespread as it actually can without really doing its primary message do justice yeah but so i'm gonna i'm gonna say don't watch this there's other things better but if you have seen this put your foot down demand better movies we we together we can ask for better <laughs> sure anywho this has been the good the bad the weird mic reviews thanks for listening peace thank you for stopping by this here town of the good the bad and the weird We appreciate your listenership, and if you want more of our takes in your life, feel free to check us out on social media at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, or TGTBTW for short. As well, if we missed a fact, your favorite part of a movie, or just have a suggestion and want to reach out and say howdy, feel free to email us at TGTBTWpodcast at gmail.com. And feel free to join our Discord at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, where we talk about movies, just share random banter here and there. And always check out our podcasters, streamers, or any other content creator we shout out in our episodes. We really appreciate it. And as always, thank you for listening. Peace.